بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم welcome to the Asalaini Postgraduate Public Review course أنا أشرف محرم I will be uh, giving you an idea about fractures of the scapula this is my neighbor he's 35 years old he had a motor car accident and suffered this isolated injury how will we treat him operative conservative how will you choose his treatment I hope by the end of this lecture, I'll help you evaluate scapular fractures, classify them, and, and identify the indications of surgical management, as well as the operative approaches, and know about the outcome of management of these cases. It's rarely broken, this the scapula. It's less than 1% of all broken bones. It's thin, elastic, freely mobile, covered with a lot of mus muscles, and it lies on the thoracic cage, which has a lot of malleability as well. It, it represents 3 to 5% of all fractures of the shoulder girdle. And it is usually part of a high energy trauma. 90% of these patients have associated injuries. The, the, the mechanism of injury is usually a direct blow. Although indirect blows can happen, usually through falling on outstretched hand and the humeral head hits the glenoid to fracture it or cause a fracture dislocation of the shoulder joint. However, direct trauma with high energy is the most common mechanism of injury and is associated with, uh, with other injuries in 70 to 100% of patients, depending on which studies. What are the common associations? Well, rib fractures and skull fractures are the most common followed by spine injuries, which are about 16% as well. Cerebral hematomas, contusions, neurological injuries, hemoneumothorax, pulmonary contusions, and subdural injuries are also common in these patients. So clinical examination includes suspicion, then inspection, cervical spine and thoracic spine examination, thoracic auscultation evaluation, neurological ev and vascular evaluation, as well as looking for associated injuries we mentioned. What is the radiological examination? Standard is an AP and lateral scapular view or called the Y view. This is, uh, both are in 45 degrees uh, parallel and perpendicular to the axis of uh, the, 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 the thorax, which is 45 degrees uh, already to the scapula. We rarely can use the axillary notch view because it is quite difficult to achieve this amount of abduction in fractured patients. CT scans with 3D reconstructions are standard procedures that help evaluate the situation. Chest X-rays are a must as well. We have to look at the cost of the, the, the lung, the costophrenic angle has to be empty and uh, look for pulmonary contusions or hemoneumothorax in a chest X-ray. So traditionally, these fractures are treated non-operatively. And over 90% of scapular fractures are non or minimally spaced and do well with conservative treatment. And the results are usually quite impressive. However, more and more studies document the residual symptoms as well as advantage of the treatment in many injuries as, um, about 30 years ago, Nordvist has published a paper about uh, 48 patients, 20% of which developed a malunion of the scapula and, for, and most of which had residual symptoms in the form of pain, this functional deficit, decreased range of motion and shoulder imbalance. So malunited fractures of the scapula results, we know results in ultra shoulder girdle dysfunction malignant dysfunction of the rotator cuff, impingement type of pain, scapular thoracic and scapular dyskinesia, which would affect shoulder function. So more and more operative treatment results are becoming published and people are considering them safe and effective. So in 2013, the AO Foundation and the, uh, the Orthopedic Trauma Association of, uh, of America um, formulated a joint commission, uh, which was headed by my dear friends, Martin Yeager and Simon Lambert, to come up with a scapular fracture classification system that's both comprehensive, reliable, and easy to use. They have divided the scapula into four bits, the fossa, F, 
which is the articular segment, the body B, which is which represents the main part of the scapula, minus the processes, which is the chromium and the coracoid process, while the S stands for the lateral scapular suspension system, FBPS. There are two levels of classification, the basic system for rapid simplified documentation, which is commonly used, and a level two system, which is more detailed and documented for mainly for scientific purposes. The fossa body, the fossa, which is the glenoid surface, is divided into F0, which the articular segment has no fracture across it, which is basically a neck fracture, while an F1 has is a simple pattern running across the glenoid, while F2 is more than one fracture line crossing uh, through the glenoid. This, as regards to the body, it might be a simple fracture with one fracture line and two exits, or more than uh, three exits involving the body. And it's subclassified uh, uh, if uh, with or without glenoid involvement. What about P? P stands for a fracture of the coracoid. P0 is a fracture of the coracoid. P1 is a fracture of the chromium, while P2 is a fracture involving both the chromium and the uh, uh, the coracoid. The lateral scapular suspension system is symboled by S. In S0, there is no lateral, uh, there is no involvement of the system. While in S1, there's an incomplete uh, failure, which means one break, which might be a fracture of the clavicle lateral to the crococlavicular ligaments, or an AC joint incomplete separation, or a fracture of the base of the coracoid, or a fracture of the spine or a chromium of the scapula, while S2 is a complete failure of the lateral suspension, uh, scapular suspension system, with usually involves either a fracture medial to the coracoclavicular ligament or a complete AC disruption with a rupture of the coracoclavicular, uh, coraco, uh, coraco, coraco, uh, coracoclavicular ligaments, or a fracture of the base of the, of the coracoid with a fracture of the spine or that of the chromium. Treatment, surgical treatment recognizes uh, three major points we have to take into consideration. One is known as the glenopolar angle, which represents the rotation of the glenoid, while the angulation of the body is also something to be considered, and the amount of medial and lateral displacement. These three elements affect the, the, the movement of the shoulder, the shoulder dyskinesia, and the function of the muscles around the shoulder, especially the rotator cuff. In a uh, systematic review, um, it was found that the most common causes of surgical intervention was glenoid fossa fractures, neck fractures, or ipsilateral clavicular fractures. Ipsilateral clavicular fractures may or may not be associated with a floating shoulder. A floating shoulder is when we have a fracture through the, the glenoid neck, and is associated with either a medial fracture of the scale of the scapula medial to the coracoclavicular ligaments or a rupture of the coracoclavicular ligament with a fracture of the distal end of uh, lateral clavicle or a complete AC disruption or an acromion fracture. If this happens, we have got a floating shoulder. And the, the question that has been asked for many years, does fixing this the clavicle in this patient with a displaced neck, neck uh, scapula and a clavicle fracture, does this reduce the, 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 the scapula neck? Well, it might be, but usually not. If you have the situation, usually go attack the clavicle first and then uh, flip the patient into a prone or lateral decubitus and then attack the glenoid as well. Intraarticular fractures of the glenoid represent 10% of the scapular fractures. 90% of those are undisplaced, while the 10 displaced ones, 10% are displaced and require surgical treatment. Uh, Eiberg classification describes uh, five types of glenoid fractures. If there's an articular step off of more than two to five millimeters or shoulder instability, the, this fracture should be fixed. While glenoid 
neck fractures are most commonly managed conservatively unless there are medialization of the glenoid uh, or rotation and, uh, of the glenoid through the glenoporal angle. Medialization of the glenoid leads to the scoping, shortening, and, musk and, and disruption and dysfunction of the rotator cuff. This displacement was found, was measured by the lateral border offset. And if it was, it is more than 10 to 20 millimeters, we consider this as disruptive to the, uh, to the rotator cuff function and shoulder function. While the glenoporal angle represents the line between the most cranial point of the glenoid at the tip of the scapula and the angle of the glenoid, it's usually between 30 and 45 degrees. And if it's more, if it's less than 20 degrees, usually results are not that good, while good and excellent results are usually less than 18 uh, in, in angles more than 20 degrees. So many studies have correlated poor outcome with glenoporal angle less than 20 degrees. Restoration of the glenoporal angle is important goal for the surgical management of fractures of glino of the of the uh, body of the scapula. Why about extra articular angulation? More than 30 to 45 degrees can result in uh, dysfunction of the shoulder muscles and scapular dyskinesia. So how do you treat that? Either ventral approach, deltopectoral approach, not commonly used except in fractures of the anterior rim of the glenoid, the corocoid fracture, or acromion fractures, while posterior approach is most commonly used for glenoid neck, glenoid neck and corpse fractures. In another systematic, uh, in the, the same systematic review, we found that 80% almost are managed to a posterior approach. Posterior approach are two types, either classical Judea approach or a Brodsky approach. The, uh, this number one incision here represents the classical Judea approach, while the Brodsky approach is, is presented by the line uh, entitled number two. In the Judea view, we get to expose the, bo the body, the neck, and the glenoid itself. We go parallel to the acromion detached part of the deltoid, although this is uh, now not recommended at all. And uh, we elevate the infraspinatus of the body of the glenoid. We leave the infraspinatus to hang on the suprascapular nerve and vessels. You can see them here. This is the glenoid uh, 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 notch, and this is the infraspinatus, and this is the, the neck of the glenoid itself. So part of the deltoid here is elevated. You've got the infraspinatus, you pick up the space between the infraspinatus and the teres minor. It's usually uh, difficult to pick up this immediately, but the more you go uh, 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 in a lateral direction, you'll be able to identify them. And one of the good tricks is uh, to lower the, 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 the diathermy uh, to one. And if you touch the infraspinatus, it will contract independently of the teres minor and you can see clearly the plane between the two muscles. Now this plane is developed between the infraspinatus and the teres minor and we can expose uh, the posterior capsule, the body, the neck and um, through the same plane. And this is again the suprascapular nerve and vessels going into the glenoid, into the infraspinatus, I mean, and you can do a capsulotomy to see inside the shoulder joint and, and identify the glenoid itself. What about the Brodsky approach? The Brodsky approach utilizes three windows, it does not involve this inserting the glenoid or uh, flipping the infraspinatus off the body of the scapula. Uh, the main window is again that between the infraspinatus and the teres minor, and the other two windows is between the teres minor and teres major, and uh, um, bet uh, between the teres minor, uh, the teres major, and the subscapularis. Um, it's a straight incision, 
develop the plane and you can get to look as it can give you most of what you, you can see what most of what you could you could see from the Broski approach what you can see in the Judea approach where to put your plate or your internal fixation you need thick strong bone so you should look for the bone around the glenoid neck the spine of the scapula you can see that in transillumination or the borders of the scapula especially the lateral border and less commonly the medial border as well so you remember my next door neighbor this is his x-ray how will you treat this guy look at his glenoporal angle look at his amount of medialization you know we say 10 to 20 milli uh, millimeters of medialization well if it's only medialization you can take 20 degrees but if it's also loss of the glenoporal angle uh, we say 20 degrees of glenoporal angle so if there's 10 milli millimeters of medialization and say uh, a glenoporal angle of less than 20 this is an indication of surgery and that's our situation here we pro we we thought he was in case for surgery we put him in a prone position use that as well open this classical judea approach detach the infraspinatus and dissected the teres minor and put two plates one on the media on the lateral border and one on the spine of the scapula and the medial border most of these patients do quite well post-operatively we know that good to excellent results in surgical management of scapular fractures when indicated is close to 84 percent what are the post-operative com complication four percent infection rate in this meta in this uh, systematic review and um, problematic or prominent hardware in seven percent that required removal and joint stiffness uh, residual pain uh, that required medication and anesthesia in four percent of the patients so my take-home message to you is be aware of high incidence of associated injuries. This is very important. This can be life-threatening. Conservative treatment is the main stay. However, operative indicate when indicated yields excellent results with a low complication rate, articular step off two to five millimeters, or in shoulder instability, medial displacement, 10 to 20 millimeters, a glenoporal angle of less than 20 degrees, and a floating shorter should be indications for operative management. Stabilization with plate and screws is the standard procedure through a posterior approach in most cases and with acceptable results. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure and I hope this is useful.